The Bane Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, another roadside attraction and a classic of science fiction. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afshirod. This week, Josh Hayes sat down with Bain Publisher, Editor-in-Chief, and Art Director Tony Weiskopf to discuss The City Who Fought by Anne McCaffrey and S.M. Sterling, a classic of science fiction back in print with Bain Books as a trade paperback and, of course, in all of your favorite ebook formats. But first... The news. Head on over to Bane.com for some free short fiction. This month's offering is an action-packed horror story by some guy named David Afsharirad. It's called See the Fairville Oddity. The meandering road trip on the back roads between Austin and Los Angeles wasn't going the way Aaron had thought it would. At the outset, it had sounded like an adventure, a way to see some of the countryside and forgotten parts of America. Instead, it felt like drudgery, miles and miles of endless nothing, until a faded billboard hove into view with the words, See the Fairville Oddity, written on it in 10-foot letters. But this detour may prove more than an amusing distraction, and an encounter at this particular roadside attraction will leave Aaron wishing he'd taken the interstate. That's See the Fairville Oddity, a short story by your humble podcast host, David F. Shirod, free to read this month at Bain.com. Can't get enough of Anne McCaffrey? To celebrate the reprinting of The City Who Fought, we're offering ebook discounts on all our McCaffrey backlist. For the month of May, get $1 off every Anne McCaffrey novel we publish. Sale ends May 31st, and this discount is good wherever Bain ebooks are sold. And that's it for the news. Hello and welcome to this week's uh, interview on the Bain Free Radio Hour. I am Josh Hayes, and this week we are talking about the city who fought. Uh, I was a complete noob when it came to this book. It's a reprint from uh, back in the early 90s, uh, and coming to this book not knowing anything about it, I really enjoyed it, and today Tony Weisskopf is going to talk with me about it. Hi, Tony, I'm, welcome to the show. I, 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 thank you. Thank you, Josh. It's good to be here. I, I will have to say that it is not just me. It is also Smokey the Cat, um, who will be adding his two cents. Um, Anna Caffrey was very much a uh, cat person and a horse person, so... I'm sure that the spirit of Anne McCaffrey is moving in Smokey here. Um, she uh, she was quite a she was she was quite the pistol too. She she was such a dynamic, lively, wonderful, um, vibrant personality, and 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 a really really great lady, um, wonderful person. Um, so uh, so I think she'd uh, she'd let Smokey have his two cents. But oh, yeah. the um, the feline in uh, insights into fiction are some of the best and well known. <laughs> <in> the- <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't I don't I don't know how much Smokey is going to contribute, to this. <laughs> other than, other than just persistent visual aid. But um, indeed, um, this is this is the uh, this this was the uh, I'm blurred. But let's see, can, can we get? Does that work? Yep, I yeah, think right? that's the. I actually do have the original an image of the original cover. Let me uh, share yeah. that as well. I, I I I really like the new cover too, actually. Um, that uh, that we've got on it. Uh, it's interesting you say that um, you came to this completely completely new. Yeah, yeah, that's the first edition. Well, actually, that's the third, probably the third, second or third printing, because um, the first edition actually had um, um, uh, shiny foil on it. Um, oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> um, c- because it is it is in fact part of a series, um, and the way that it came to Bain 
uh, was through a packager named uh, Bill Fawcett, who would um, who would have been here with us talking about the book today, except um, he's a very uh, in-demand lecturer for cruise ships, um, and he's cruising the Mediterranean right now. So I can't beat that. Bain Free Radio Hour, cruising Mediterranean, getting paid to do it. Hey, Bill has his priorities, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I know but, what I would pick. Yeah. Bain is obviously the show here. <laughs> Oh, well done, Josh. Good. <laughs> back, in, back in the 80s, um, uh, uh, Annie had um, just tremendous, well, 70s and 80s, a tremendous success with her uh, Dragon Riders of Pern series. Um, yeah. She was regularly hitting the times list. Um, she was, uh, in fact, the, the one of the one of the Pern books was, I believe, The White Dragon was the first um, science fiction mass market book to uh, hit number one on the uh, the Times list. So, oh, very nice, yeah. Um, so uh, all, all of this, um, uh, you know, women in science fiction, they really need a hand up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're doing pretty well. From you know, from the very beginning, and, and again, to be, we should mention too that her her publisher um, at the time was Judy Lynn Del Rey. Um, so, uh, uh, another great lady of science fiction. Indeed. So, at any rate, um, uh, Anne was doing really, really well with the Dragon Riders of Pern, but she had other stories that she wanted to tell. Um, and Bill brought to us a um, a package of uh, three novels: um, Sassenach, The Death of Sleep, and The Generation. Uh, warriors um, that um, uh, we we paired uh, Annie with rising up and coming um, strong science fiction writers, people who were gonna be great, um, but uh, who uh, who were just at the beginning of their career and sure. who had more time. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so so that's how we got those books with um, with Elizabeth Moon and, and uh, Jody Lynn Nye. Um, who have indeed, as promised, become major forces and, and, and major writers um, uh, uh, leading the field on, on their own. Um, and those did so well and were so much fun to do that um, Annie returned to a uh, another series that she had that she wanted to do more in. Um, and that was uh, um, based around the novel The Ship Who Sang. Um, which is one of my favorite uh, books of hers, um, and it's it, it 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 tells the story of two people: one uh, one person who um, has been handicapped um, and whose body has uh, is on is on life support, but whose brain is active, and um, uh, who is paired with a uh, a brawn. So we have a brain and a brawn. And uh, and the story is what these what this combination of these two people can do. Um, and the uh, and, and uh, we had a couple of other writers um, who worked with Annie before Steve Sterling. Uh, Misty Lackey was one, The Ship Who Searched, one of my favorite science fiction novels. Um, uh, we should mention that uh, Misty Lackey has just been this weekend being named a Grand Master by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. Yeah, but Misty writes really great science fiction, too. Um, and it's not just fantasy, although her fantasy, must be admitted, is really good. Right. <laughs> But she writes great science fiction, and The Ship Who Searched was a fantastic science fiction novel. Uh, Margaret Ball wrote uh, uh, one in this series as well, um, and uh, and Steve Sterling um, wrote uh, the the City Who Fought, and uh, that's that's the novel that, uh, that that we'll be talking about today. But that's a little bit of the uh, the, the the history of how this series um, came came to be and came to Bane. Um, it's interesting because, uh, like I said, I didn't know that the, sh the story itself was part of a series until I was about halfway through. And I was like, I think I'm missing some things here. And then I Googled and found, obviously, it's it's the third book in, in basically the grouping of, of stories told here. And uh, because I started the book and I go, man, the, the learning curve on this book is so high going into it <laughs> and then it made sense to me after be, after learning it was a uh, part of a series but i like the idea of the brain brawn duality um yeah. and i i know that that's it's kind of been done before but i think looking back and i was talking with another friend of mine a lot of the uh things that are used in this book a lot of the elements that are in this book 
right now they've been done before but back 30 years ago <laughs> this was like cutting edge nobody had done this before and it was really it's really interesting having to keep that in mind while i was reading the book going wow these are really cool concepts that like some of us now in in kind of modern day science fiction are, are talking about going i've got this great idea but no 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 these were presented originally back 30 years ago and it's it's interesting to see the how some of those ideas come across on the page yeah i i you know i think um i think it's always fun to see how new people approach science fiction ideas right um asimov was not the first person to write about robots in science fiction sure uh, you know i mean we can go all the way back to you know, uh the carol chopic and and R U R, um you know talking about robots and jack williamson had his humanoids um, um but that didn't mean that asimov didn't have amazing things to say about robots right right um, and, uh, so, so, so I think that there's, um, e even though these ideas, um, when we're talking about, um, uh, human, um, AI combinations, which is really what the brains are, right? Right. Um, they're getting inputs from lots and lots of sensors and they're using, um, uh, they're using far future technology to, to process all of this sensory information. Right. Um, and uh, this is stuff that, you know, that some, that they authors are actually working on now, Rob Hampson, I'm looking at you, right. <laughs> 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 you, know, you know, we, he's, he's a, um, he's a working neurologist and uh, he's an, ex I don't know how, how you describe it precisely, but, but you know, he's working on, on actually making the technologies that would make this kind of stuff happen. He's working on making that happen right now here in right. 2022. Um, so um, we obviously don't have the spaceships yet. Um, you know, we need Musk for that, but <laughs> right. he's, there. he's, he's working on it. He, he, he is. Can, he is. can you speed it up just a little bit though? I, he's you know, distracted, whatever. But, um, uh, yeah, no, I think the, the the brain and the brawn combination was interesting. The, the also the the kind of almost virtual reality that was uh, that he uses later on in the book when they start dealing with um, the uh, Colt Colt Col Col Mari. Yeah. Yes, yeah. they're they're trying to hack into the computer system, and he has this like uh, really stylized virtual reality plane almost that he's he's operating on which i thought was really interesting because um the you, you kind of when you first get to know simeon he's very he comes off as very immature yes. and and knowledgeable in a sense that he's like extremely book knowledge book smart but doesn't know how to deal with people which is why he's got the brawn but then you find out later that not only is he really book smart but he's really intuitive in trying to set these systems up to make the station work as efficiently as possible and you're like okay well he's not just an uh uh immature kid-like entity he's doing a lot of things that a lot of people might not give him credit for he is and, and you know i think he's a very fresh and relatable character to us in 2022 i think um he's he's introduced um in, in the middle of his uh, virtual reality war game right yeah um, and uh, he's he's got an alternate history setting with um, with Wellington and uh, uh, fighting um, uh, fighting Napoleon um, uh, in Britain, right? Um, and and so you know those of us who have lived through 2020 and you know 2021 and you know spend a lot of time on our computer, right, can relate to this, right? Right. <laughs> right. You know? right. You know, he's he's living a lot of his life a lot and 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 getting a lot of joy from from this virtual reality. Um, the difference is is that he can't put his headphones down and go out, right? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and in some sense, that is his putting his headphones down and going out because yes. uh, uh, and other uh, otherwise he's you know, I don't know that they I can think of a, a description of what his living situation is other than he is the station, but going right. into the yeah. right, going into the, the VR is kind of his going outside and and um it, it, it I think some of the funniest instances of the book where he doesn't he kind of 
oversteps himself as the station is yes he's everywhere all the time but he shouldn't be everywhere all the time and and how does that uh how does that relate to people that are like no this is a private situation you shouldn't be here and i thought that those elements were handled really into um really well in that it it's still like he's, he's still that immature type of being that's learning how to interact with everyone yes yeah absolutely and 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 mccaffrey and sterling just do it so effortless effortless so easy. yes yeah there we go 100 right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, it, I, I read a lot of slush okay I, I read a lot of manuscripts so that you guys don't have to yeah <laughs> and and thank I, you for that i appreciate I, that and you are welcome <laughs> 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 but 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 stepping into this novel it's just, it's so, you're, you're just, you're just wrapped around with competence. <laughs> right. Um, the first three chapters of this book um, are just a, a lovely masterclass in how to introduce characters, how to introduce science fictional settings, because they set up three separate cultures, right? Yes. They set up they set up the pirate culture, they set up the refugee culture and they set up the uh the the um the the city the city uh, brain brawn culture. Right. All three of those things are fully realized in the first three chapters of this book. You have a firm grasp of Simeon's character. You have a firm grasp of his brawn, his new brawn, right? That's the problem that, that, that comes in. He's like, oh my God, you know, the brawn that I was used to, the guy that I liked, and we had a wonderful working relationship, and he was great. And now I have to break in this new person that I don't freaking want to. Right, <laughs> right. right. And, and she doesn't want to be there either. And and so we have this, this tension right off between the two of them. But well, and I thought that the, the, the civilizations were so fully realized that that was part of the learning curve. But then also as I'm, as you're going through, none of those civilizations are anything that resembles anything that we know specifically here on earth. They're very alien in nature. They're they're They have developed into the future in hundreds and hundreds of years into the future as something completely different that we would imagine as a, a civilization now. Yeah. And all three were different. All three made sense uh, to what the civilization turned into and, and what it was doing. And I thought that, like you said, very well presented so it's not some kind of convoluted info dumping type of yeah. description and, and inter introduction to those yeah it's they give you just as much information as you need just the, only the strokes that are needed to paint that picture are there nothing is not n nothing that you don't need is there um and and all of it serves if you if you have that sort of exploratory science fictional i you know, I, whoa that's different that's weird i need to know more about that they give you just enough to trail you you know to so that you follow on that trail of breadcrumbs um and you keep on turning uh, and 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 one of the things that that that, that again just absolute deft master master touches here um is that simeon is a real asshole um, <laughs> 100 percent true and and uh uh hap what, what's your first name? channa channa, channa, hap. channa hap is i mean she's called the stone cold bitch several times because right. he is right <laughs> right and and yet we still like them right well and i think sympathy i Right. I think the interesting thing about liking those characters is you don't at first because you don't understand them. And then as you understand them, you begin to realize uh, you begin to empathize and like them, like them, which which I thought was really good in in the presentation of of the story itself. Like some some characters you first meet and you're like, I like this character. And then that's just it. You like the character through the entire book. And these characters, you're like, I, I really don't know if I like these characters. <laughs> and by the end of the, the, the novel, you're like, oh, they, they're really good. And I think that goes to show like flaws and troubled characters that 
have to deal with their own kind of situations and gives you a glimpse of not only the troubles that they're going with, but how they're dealing with it. And that tells you a lot about the character too. Yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's, it's not a whole lot of psychoanalysis, right? It's, right. These are people who have wives and interactions and friends and jobs, and we get to see them doing all of that. But, you know, these these lives and interactions and friends and jobs are in this really cool, far future science fictional world, right? Right, <laughs> right. Where all this kind of neat stuff goes on. Um, and then, of course, there's the character of Jote, right? Uh, I love Jote, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Steve Sterling loves Jote, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> But but so so we have um, we have this sort of troubled first you know first few days first few weeks between Simeon and Channa, um, and uh, one of the problems that Channa runs into as she's shaking down the you know, doing her job and exploring the ship and, and looking into the nooks and crannies is she finds a feral human. Right. <laughs> you know? and, and first of all, that's such a lovely thing. Right. Is that, you know, the, so many people have the future being just all perfect. Right. Yeah. And, and like a like a Star Trek type of everything is uh, utopian and everybody gets along and it's all and flowers and roses. And everything's accounted for. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, there, there's not a stowaway on the Enterprise. <laughs> right. Unless it's Q or whatever. Well, and and not. And, and that like the ability for her to disappear says a lot about how uh, limited Sim Simeon is yes. as the station, right? Like, so he's not all powerful, all seeing. And that aspect of his personality is shown through what Joke can do. Yes. And, and then, and, and as we discover, all right, here's this interesting little you know little flaw in in the station this is going to become hugely important to the plot later on right as as, as it's it, we have to deal with more than just a feral human right right <laughs> so, yeah one you know one small feral person um and on top of all of that they're discussing um uh, issues of uh how we uh, how we approach gender right all of that, you know, all of that is there in the first, in, in the first three chapters is, you know, what are, what are the characters' attitudes towards gender? What are the, um, uh, what are the various um, uh, cultures' attitudes toward gender? What should it be? Um, and we get to see lots, you know, lots and lots of little, very, you know, interactions and variations um, uh, on this theme just right up front. Um, and you get to see it through multiple lenses. So you get to yes. see it through Simeon and the people that live on the station, but also the Bethelites and also the Colnari. And all of them have kind of a different view on gender and uh, even even genetics. Uh, you know, when you start yes. to look at what the Colnari are looking for and what they do and how they how they even cherish life or, or the lack of like you know uh yeah. so i like i really liked the um i mean you mentioned it's not kind of a it's not an in-depth like look at gender or culture in a sense of like a, a great literary piece but you do get to see an uh an in-depth kind of overview of of different cultures and how they become and how they start to look at different issues, and I thought that was really nice. Is they they don't they don't really poke at this is right or this is wrong. It's exactly. just this is how it is. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's one of those things that science, you know, that great science fiction does, right? This is a whole theme of Glory Road, for instance, right? Is that your way of seeing things is not universal, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> and, and and part of what science fiction, you know, does is uh, is explore how those how, how things are going to change. Right. So there's not so there's not a right and a wrong. Right. It's different characters have different attitudes and different cultures have different attitudes. And that's part of the story. So it's it's not um, I, I don't want you to get the idea that it's some sort of didactic didactic, you know, Ursula Le Guin type, you know, exploration. Right. It's not right just it's part of those layers that that McCaffrey and Sterling have in this story um, and I think it's part of what makes it fresh for for today as well um, 
Oh yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I, I know Tony Daniel didn't really like to discuss craft too terribly much on these things. He'd, he'd rather discuss story too. Well, I love it. So whatever you want to, uh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because it's 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 difficult as a writer to read a book and pick out what you like as a reader because I'm reading it going, this is what I would or would not do as an author or seeing, okay, I see sure. what they're doing in the story. For instance, like the VR battles, I knew that that wasn't going to be just a pastime that he would enjoy. I knew from the writer side that it would come back later <laughs> on and mean something. So it was nice to see those connections in the book. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, you know, and, 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 a, you know, the great authors will, well, you know, will put that Chekhov's gun up there on the mantle, and you know that they're doing that, and it's okay because it makes sense as part of the plot, right? Yeah, it, it, it makes sense for these characters to do these things, and you're like, ah, I see. Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> right. And and a lot of a lot of seat of the pants writers will realize that they need that gun a little too late in the story, so they'll throw it in when they need it. And that's fine, so long as you have that editorial pass that goes back and puts in the <laughs> right puts in the earlier work. So, for instance, if you're going to have Simeon be this fantastic strategic genius, which he is, and you need that for the climax of your book, right? Exactly. Then you absolutely you can't just have him pull that out of his ass late in the story, <laughs> right? So it is, in fact, the first thing we see him doing. Um, and that's you know, and and that's and that's okay because that's part of how we're establishing his character. Um, so uh, there's that delicate balance, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that the it's it's interesting because uh, again, this was written 30 years ago. So um, some of the fiction that's written now, the storytelling is different in the way that you would present the story, and so the the battle between the the station and the city and everybody in the culinary it's presented differently than it may be presented today mm -hmm. and this is not to say it's it's wrong or bad it's just different and i and the um the way in which it wasn't a stand-up fight and could not be a stand-up fight based on many factors based on they didn't really have warriors they didn't have an army they couldn't fight off the the superhuman uh colnari that were just super strong and they were ruthless and and so everything had to be um basically intellectually beating them at their own game pretty much and and i and i liked that kind of um quasi guerrilla warfare that yeah. that some of the stuff that Joe was messing around with and you <laughs> to her own benefit in the station comes back into play uh, when they're, you know, doing these guerrilla tactic fights on the, the Colnaria. I really enjoyed that. And it wasn't just a stand up gunfight. And, and they said almost, I think around the 50% mark, yeah, they're going to get here. There's nothing that we can do. And then everybody starts panicking. And I, and I, it's interesting to see the different reactions, like the doctor and the doctor's kid and, and all of those uh, very personal reactions about we're all going to die. <laughs> and, and how do people react to that? Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, and again, you know, fighting uh, battles in and of themselves are not interesting. Right. Indeed. Um, it's, 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 you know, why do we care? Um, you know, why do we care that one side wins over another? Um, otherwise, it's just a technical exercise. It's just, you know, it's just a VR battle. It's just right. a new game. Um, and that's what, you know, that, 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 you know, that's what the fiction is for. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that part of it is so much fun. And, you know, I'm trying not to talk about Ukraine, Russia, but we're just going to throw it out there. Look, you know. <laughs> <laughs> guerrilla warfare is always going to be relevant right right 100 uh, yeah um so uh so writing about it in a way um showing how ordinary people uh respond to stress um but again in that cool science fiction far future where you can do so much um you know that's part of what you know uh, is, is for me the thrill of science fiction 
Um, so, oh, yeah, talking just you know very briefly about uh, about craft. I'm going to talk about right at the beginning of chapter three, um, and talking about different styles and, and the way that things are done nowadays versus the way that things might have, you know you know were were done um, earlier. Well, I, I'm finding a lot of people. Um, don't understand the, the the purpose of chapter breaks, the purpose of um, line breaks within chapters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the difference between a line break, a chapter break, a scene end, and a, and a part end, right? Each of those things indicates a different kind of conclusion, right? Just as a period ends a sentence, um, a chapter break ends a particular sequence of events. Um, it's, a, it's an organized part. Um, and I think today we have a tendency to just write everything, right? To just write, he came in the, he came in the door and he flipped on the light and he scratched his ass and he sat in the chair and the cat leaped on him, right? Right. So, <laughs> right. Right. Do we need all that? You know, Maybe, I'm guessing not, right? Unless that ass scratching is really, really important to what happens later, right? He has fleas and, you know, somehow they- Right, they, exactly. They, you know, I don't care, right? I don't need all of that. You, the writer, may need that. <laughs> so you may need to get it all down on the page. Um, but I, the reader, don't need that. Um, so uh, these guys, they have this, the, the, right at the beginning of chapter three, they just have this lovely- Three paragraph, one line break setup that establishes one of the good points about Chana's character. And it's uh, Is it really necessary to inspect in person, Ms. Hap? The detection systems chief said, We have a virtual system for remotes, he went on helpfully. No substitute for hands on, Chana said with determined cheerfulness, right? So we know exactly what kind of person she is just from that, right? Right. Right. And we admire that. We may not like her, but we admire it. <clears throat> she reached up to the hatchway and chimed herself, sliding into the narrow inspection corridor. Hand me up the toolkit, will you? And then there's the line break. Yeah. We don't have the description of what she does with the toolkit. We don't we don't go into what that toolkit is. We don't have to we don't have to, you know, have our hand wave him for the, you know, we don't have to waste our energy on, you know, coming up with, all right, well, how does this actually work, right? We have a line break. <laughs> <laughs> all of that, all of that the reader is filling in. Right. The reader just fills it in line break. Two hours later, the chief stood rigidly as Chana finished her checklist. Right? Right? We, we know exactly what happened. His skin was a muddy gray under the natural brown, and he seemed to be shaking slightly. Right? So <laughs> yeah, right? That, that tells us everything we need to know. Everything we need to know about her. Everything we need to know about what just happened, but with no extraneous detail. And that's what that line break is for. It's for that two hours of stuff that we, the reader, don't need to know for the plot because we've already got all of this there. So elegant. So well done. <laughs> oh, and there's a lot of it. I mean, that's one instance of how they do that. And I and I agree. I, I think it's, it's really well done. And they do that. She does it uh, several times in the book where there's even a, a a smaller section and I don't remember where it was, but it was like one or two lines and they're kind of going through a sequence of events and basically just hitting the high parts. Now, I don't know how long the actual novel is. I estimated it like 120,000 words, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if that was it or not. Yeah. But, yeah. It's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty thick book. Yeah. 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 Probably 120, 130 somewhere in there. Yeah. And, and they, they, I mean, even the prologue is so, or not the the prologue, the epilogue at the end is so. It's it's short. It's it's there's no extraneous, uh, mass villain just monologue of anything. It's 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 literally one word, and I thought that that was so powerful. <laughs> yeah. uh, um. Well, the he says one word. The ep epilogue yeah. is three paragraphs, yeah, yeah, and then yeah, he yeah, says yeah. one word. And that in and of itself <laughs> is, is so much about their writing skill that they don't they knew that they didn't need to drag that out. Amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it, it really is. It, it's just, you know, it's just a charming, lovely book. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's full of adventure and action and fun characters. Um, and, it, you know, it makes you think, right? You yeah. know, it, it, it makes you think. And um, this is how excited I am. I'm going to shake my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're so we're really happy we're getting to re, to reprint it and hopefully uh, let it find a new audience um, and uh, let you know let people discover you know of course Steve Sterling is another one of those he was he was a successful writer when when he collaborated with Anne um, and uh, after this he became a, a New York Times bestseller for his solo books and his alternate histories um, and uh, he's you know he's gone on to do amazing things and. Um, so you may be familiar with, with Steve Sterling's work because he's still he's still writing, right? Um, but you know, but Annie passed away, and uh, you know we 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 have her her body of work, and and hopefully this will let people discover um, the wonder that is you know Anne McCaffrey, um, as well as the, the wonder that is Steve Sterling. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm I've got to go back and pick up the other ones in the series so I can oh, yeah. uh, I can. I enjoy the uh, the rest of the universe because I mean, like you said, we we said a couple of times the the universe is so well realized, yeah, um, that it's it's a joy just to kind of experience. Um, it, is. It, it is bring tissues for the sh for the ship who searched. I'm just going to tell you right uh -oh. now. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Parts of it are sad, but then it's triumphant. So. <laughs> Well, the city who fought is the the reprint is out now. I think it came out a couple of days ago, oh, great. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, of course, it's still on audio. Um, and you're doing uh, a full hardcover re-release. Is it is it going to be in bookstores as well? Yes, it, it, it'll be a trade paperback, and yes, it's in in bookstores and libraries and ebook um, ebook versions, of course, um, with a lovely new cover and, um, and you know, every, the artwork is beautiful. Every of my books, yeah. So, uh, well, Tony, thank you very much for talking with me today about the book and uh, Listen, uh, everyone a, that it was our pleasure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So, okay. <laughs> I appreciate you. Uh, everybody that, that came in and hung out today for the show. Thank you for uh, joining us on this interview for the Bain Free Radio Hour. And I don't know if David has anything else lined up after this segment of the podcast, but uh, he'll take care of it from his end. So thank you, Tony. And, and uh, we'll. We'll end the show there and move on. All right. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony worlds Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens, not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be. A cobra. All too soon, it was Johnny's turn. Okay, Moro, everything's been reset, Bai told him. Remember, you're being judged on stealth and observation, not speed. Take your time and remember all the stuff I've been lecturing you about the past couple of evenings and you should be okay. Hmm? Okay? Go. Johnny took off across the mud, running hunched over to give any hypothetical optical sensors a smaller target to work with. Ten meters from the wall, he slowed, splitting his attention to search for trip wires, wall-mounted sensors, and possible climbing routes. Nothing hazardous caught his attention. On the debit side, the wall had no obvious handholds either. At the base, Johnny gave the wall one final scan. Then, hoping his height estimate was close enough, he bent his knees and jumped. If anything, he erred on the short side, and at the very peak of his arc, his curved fingers slid neatly over the top of the wall. So far, so good. From his new vantage point, Johnny could see the photoelectric apparatus, from which he could tell that he would need to clear a maximum of twenty centimeters in getting over. A relatively easy task, provided he didn't bring the pseudo-troths down on him in the process. 
Clicking his back teeth together, he activated his auditory enhancers, clicked three times more to run them to max. The sound of impacting rain reached frequency saturation and leveled out at a dull roar. Beneath it, fainter noises became audible. None of them, he decided, sounded like remotes slogging through mud. Mentally crossing his fingers, he eased his head above the wall, switching off his super-hearing as he did so. The inner building was smaller than he'd expected, a single-story structure covering perhaps a tenth of the walled-in area. No guards were visible near it. Shifting his attention, he gave the rest of the courtyard a quick sweep. Empty. Either he'd been incredibly lucky and all the guards were momentarily on the far side of the building, or else they were all inside, perhaps watching through the darkened windows. Either way, he had little choice but to grab the opportunity. Pulling hard with his right arm, he sent his legs and torso up and over the wall, vaulting horse-style, tucking his arms to his chest as he did so to clear the photobeam. Beneath him he got his first glimpse of the area where he would land, and of the dull metallic sheen of the remote standing there. The single thought, unfair, was all he had time for. Kicking in his targeting lock, he snapped his hands into firing position and gave the remote a double blast. His attention on his shooting, his landing a second later, was embarrassingly clumsy. But he had the satisfaction of seeing the guard hit the ground the same time he did. But there was no reason yet for self-congratulation. And almost before he had his balance back, Johnny was running toward the building. Wherever the rest of the remotes were, they would be bound to discover their downed colleague before too long, and he had to move while there was still something left of his initiative. Reaching the nearest wall, he sidled to the corner and took a quick look around it. No one in sight, but he could see the steps leading to an entrance door. Breaking into a run again, he headed for it. Even without his auditory enhancers on, the buzzer that went off beside him was deafening. Johnny cursed under his breath. Obviously, he'd hit one of the automatics Bai had warned them about. In a hurry or not, he still should have taken the time for a careful search. Now it was too late and there was nothing to do but prepare for combat. If he could get inside before the remotes reacted to the alarm, there might still be a chance. He was at the door, aiming his laser at the solder lock, when a remote came around the far corner. Johnny hurled himself from the building in a flat dive, arms swinging around as he targeted the guard. But even as he squeezed off the shot, the door to his side slammed open, and before he could do more than twist his head to see, he felt the dull punch of a die pellet against his ribs. And, announcing his failure to the world, the alarm hooted from the wall. Feeling like an idiot, Johnny got to his feet and looked around for the way out. Let that be a lesson to you, someone said from the building, and Johnny turned to see a man with a Cobra Operations patch on his coveralls standing behind the remote who'd shot him. When you've got two or more targets, it can actually be faster to slag the first one visually without the targeting lock. Thanks, sir, Johnny sighed. How do I get out? Right over there. You can head back and get cleaned up. And if it helps, a lot of the others did worse. Swallowing, Johnny nodded and set off in the indicated direction. It wasn't much comfort to know that others would have died sooner. Dead is still dead. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer, Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Josh Hayes and Tony Weiskopf for discussing The City Who Fought today. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirerod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>